Good evening and welcome to the October 2nd Queen Anne's County Public School Board meeting. Can I get a motion to resume open session? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Can I stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Ms. Bennett. Pursuant to the general provisions, Articles 3-305, and 3-104, the Board of Education of Queen Anne's County met in a closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom this public body has jurisdiction and any other personal matter that affects one or more specific individuals. To consult with counsel to obtain legal advice and to consult with staff, consultants, or other individuals about potential or pending litigation. Thank you. Can I get a motion to um, amend the agenda? Make a motion to amend the agenda, add uh, 6-08 uh, legislation. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So I can I get a motion to approve the agenda as amended? Okay. Or can so I get moved. A Second. All those in favor? Aye. Okay. Can I get a motion to approve the minutes of the closed and open sessions from September the 18th? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. All right. Awards. Wow. That's part of the night. It Good is. Good job. Good evening. The best part of the night, oh, we are going to do our awards. Our first award is the Energizer Bunny Award. This award is presented to our staff member who keeps going and going and is sponsored by Bayview Financial with Mr. Chip Birmingham and Mr. Wayne Humphreys, if they'll please come forward. The October Energizer Bunny Award has been nominated by Mr. Stephen Rafter, who is the Bayside Elementary School Assistant Principal. If he could please come forward. And actually, I, I see the principal here too, so if Ms. Welsh would please come up as well. So the October Energizer Bunny Award winner this month is Ms. Monica White, the BES music teacher. Mr. Raptor says, Mrs. White is being recognized for her unwavering commitment to the students of Bayside Elementary School. She consistently goes above and beyond for our students to ensure they receive the care and education they each deserve. She continues to identify creative ways to meet the needs of her students by implementing unique strategies that all students can access. Her commitment to the band and chorus here at BES is unrivaled. Additionally, Mrs. White's expertise in scheduling has been essential to the success here at Bayside. Mr. Bell, who's also here, if he'd please come forward, supervisor of visual and performing arts instruction adds, Monica has been exceptional in supporting all music students and learning their instruments and has gone above and beyond by researching adaptive music strategies to help our highest needed students. Her hard work and dedication has greatly enriched our professional development efforts. So thank you, Mrs. White, for your dedication and excellence to our students here. And our next award is our Spirit Award. The Spirit Award is given to an individual who embodies the spirit of Queen Anne's County Public Schools. The October Spirit Award has been nominated by Mr. John Groh, who's our Supervisor of Accountability, if he'd please come forward. And our October Spirit Award winner is Mr. Kevin Michaels, Instructional Technology Coordinator and Webmaster.
Mr. Gross says Kevin is an unbelievable team player within the accountability team where he is always willing and eager to help central office and schools with any specific needs. Kevin is the guru of Schoology that assists teachers with their instruction and grading. Also his technical abilities and knowledge around data privacy, websites, and data define definitely make our team stronger. When in doubt, call Kevin. He's got your back. Our last award, award for this evening is the Shining Star Award. This award is presented to an individual in our school system who shines. The October Shining Star has been nominated again by Mr. John Groh, the Supervisor of Accountability, and our October Shining Star is Mr. Chris Brown, Data Specialist and Power School Administrator. Mr. Gross says, Chris has been the staple in the accountability department over the years and better known as the power school guy. Chris has basically been the architect within our power school system that assists teachers, administrators, supervisors, parents, students, and or anyone associated with the school system. His skills are accurately organized to keep Queen Anne's County Public School running smoothly and up to date with the state department. Chris is always willing to help anyone with his knowledge base over the years, no matter what department. If you are looking for something or wondering about something in power school, call Chris. Queen Anne's County Public School is lucky to have him. Involvement is next. Who would like to speak? Well, we had the opportunity this uh, past month to go to a couple athletic uh, games at the schools. Very interesting to see our kids play and have a good time. Also, would like to give kudos to our new sidewalk from Central Elementary. I'm sorry, yes. Central Middle School to the High School, which now allows our kids to access the Y. It looks good. Uh, I think it's going to be a great asset. So, thanks a lot for everybody put in that. Uh, Churchill Elementary, back to school night. Awesome. I started my night in third grade, so it was pretty cool. Got to see some of the teachers that uh, my kid got to work with when she was there. They had a wonderful program, a lot of uh, vendors helping out in the cafeteria. Um, and I understand that we have a new quarterback for Queen Anne's County High football team, and he's awesome, so got to check him out. <laughs> All right. All right, anything else? Um, well, I would like uh, kudos to our, to Mr. Bell. I'm sorry he's already left because I guess we have some amazing, again, dancers who are just mm -hmm. taking all of yes. these awards, which is awesome. Um, also a shout out to our food services, our new food services department. We had spoken about trying to do, not trying, but we were going to bring on board new local farms and we have done it. We've started with our apples from Blades Orchard. So please help yourselves to a, um, a wonderful apple. I've already had one, it was delicious. And then I also had the pleasure of attending, an, a, well, of kind of help hosting the Maryland Office of Overdose Response when they were here and we got to see some of our, our age, uh, the same age people who are our ambassadors. And I really think it resonates with kids when they have people their own age that are helping them to, mm -hmm. of course, the first thing is prevention, you know, to try to keep people out of drugs. So a lot of work and a lot of effort, a great escape room, I understand, for the opioid um, epidemic to help educate people. So that was a fantastic afternoon. 
Alexis, did you have something? No, I'm good. Okay. All right. Dr. Salins. Um, yes. Did you? Okay. Yes. I didn't know. I thought I saw the student board members. I didn't. Oh. Know. Should we do this? Oh, first? you know that. I'm sorry. That okay. that is first. I apologize. Wait, Miss Schrader, would you like They're to go first? They're ready to go. I know sure. they are. <laughs> yeah. Um, October is definitely a busy month for our school. So there's a lot of things going on. I was going to update. Um, I don't know if you know. We have an advisory period. It's after first period. It's like 30 minutes. Um, in a certain classroom, you have a group of people in your grade. And on Mondays and Fridays, we're doing these win days where you get to sign up to do clubs, meetings, um, different activities. There's like a nature walk, um, watercolors. You can get extra help on your schoolwork. Um, Tuesdays and Wednesdays are um, designated for academic support. So on Tuesdays, it's first and third period. You can go and get help for those classes. Wednesday is second and fourth period. You can get help with those. And then Thursdays for advisory, there's a normal advisory class here with your group and you're scheduling for the following week what you're gonna do, like what clubs or meetings you're gonna meet with. This week is um, the week of homecoming. It's on Saturday. So we have our spirit week. We've had different um, spirit week themes. Um, we have a, our homecoming theme is Hokoween. So it's like Halloween homecoming. <laughs> um, so it's Saturday, October 4th, our parade is at 11. Our game against um, Wacomico High School is at 1 p.m. Our theme is Pink Out for Breast Cancer Awareness. And then our dance is from six to eight at our school. Um, October 13th, we have our Interact Club from our school, the student leaders. Um, they're going to the Ravens game for free and they're gonna like meet the players afterwards. That's cool, that's been set up. And then October 7th through 11th, they're um, through like our career coach um, there is going to be resume writing, interview questions for seniors. I know we, there was a trip last year. It was like a leadership trip for the juniors. This is some activity for seniors. October 14th through 17th, we have a LinkedIn social media session, um, advice from career coaches, networking lessons, volunteers coming in for mock interviews, and then Willow Roots Photography is coming in to take headshots for some seniors, and that was all made possible for, by the senior English department. And then October 10th, we have Hispanic Heritage Night. Um, a lot of the Spanish teachers from the Spanish department and uh, Spanish club students and just regular um, students in Spanish class are helping out with that. October 16th, there's PSAT testing for 10th grade students. I promise I'm almost done. There's a lot going on. Um, October 21st, um, our counseling office is hosting a field trip for interested juniors and seniors going to University of Maryland College Park. There's a field trip for that. And then October 25th is our first student of the month um, <laughs> event. And that'll be in the media center. They have coffee and donuts for all the attendees. And then November 1st is when our fall play begins. And that's What's busy the play month. this year, do you know yeah. that? What was that? Oh, what the play is yet? This, I do not. Okay. I should know. But. That's all right. That's all right. I'm sure we'll see it soon enough. Yeah. Thank you very much, yeah. Miss Smith. Um, we're just as busy at Queen Anne's. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, on September 16th, they sent out homecoming court nomination forms, and today, final voting for the homecoming court began. The 23rd started our pet food drive, and that's ending October 9th. And then on September 27th, interim reports were emailed home. And my guidance counselor told me that 15% of seniors have submitted their college applications. Nice. Um, throughout September, after school, college help sessions happen with guidance. And they're going to be continued throughout the month of October as needed. Um, so from October 7th next week to October 12th is our homecoming spirit week. Um, good this year. And then on Friday is our pep rally during fourth period. Thursday is the powder puff game at four and the Hall of Fame inductions at six. And homecoming is also on Friday from seven to nine. And then on Saturday, we have our homecoming parade at 10 a.m. starting at Kennard Elementary and ending at the high school. And homecoming football game is at 12 p.m. And then on October 6th, um, only pre-registered 10th and 11th grade students are taking the PSAT. October 7th is National Honor Society inductions at 5 p.m. And then October 22nd is when we're starting to order our caps and gowns, which is exciting. And then um, October 24th is Makeup Picture Day for everyone but seniors, because seniors have to schedule appointments directly through Legacy Studios. 
And then on November 2nd, there's Make a Difference Day at Southersville Middle School. And our Young Explorers Club are like actively having meetings and planning their trip to Ireland, Scotland, and England for this summer, which is exciting. It is. All right, thank you. That is a and lot of information, a lot of stuff everything. going on. Thank which you awesome. both. Very Appreciate fun. that. All right, <laughs> Dr. Salins. Yes. So it has been busy as well getting out to the schools. Um, I think I've really enjoyed some of the um, games that I've been able to, to watch and specifically Monday as they battled out the volleyball team. Both sides were, the, the ladies were just amazing. They have such skill sets and I was just so impressed and glad to be a part of it. Stole a little bit of my thunder because I was going to announce that this week is Maryland Homegrown School Lunch Week. And so um, kudos and shout out to Julie Hickey for reaching out to get that partner, mm. our first really local partner. And I know that that's gonna continue to grow, but um, great program, we've had a good kickoff as we've switched, you know, mm -hmm. from working with Sodoxo to kind of being out on our own. It's been a nice smooth transition, so thank you. Just a side note, um, <clears throat> if you took a donut, you need to heat yeah. it up for 10 seconds before you try to eat it. Mm -hmm. huh? Just if anybody took a donut, you need to heat it up for 10 seconds before <laughs> you try to eat it. Yeah, Good to know. They're made, right. to, be they're made to be he he heated. eaten warm. Ah. Okay. <laughs> Good to know. We're just full of, yes. You come with instructions. <laughs> oh, we did. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it just came with a little instruction. All yeah. right. <laughs> okay. Next is citizen participation. So we have a number, um, but before we start. We ask all speakers to keep in mind the following guidelines. Speakers should sign the roster, including their phone number and address. Comments should be limited to three minutes in length. Comments longer than three minutes should be submitted in writing. Statements to the board should relate to a matter of general policy over which the board has authority. Comments about the actions or statements of individual staff members are not appropriate for public comments and should be referred to the superintendent of schools or the board president. If you have a specific question, the board will make sure an appropriate staff member responds to your question. The board respects your desire and your right to convey your message freely, but asks as a courtesy to this board and our citizens that you show respect for all. First up, Mr. Richard McNeil. Just to make an announcement, that fan makes it very difficult to hear what's going on up here. Okay, so. Thank you. Unless I was the only one having problems, but no, no. you just can't hear back there. Gotcha. You guys can just tell me to turn up up next to this fan so I can't really hear it. <laughs> tell me to turn up anytime. Thank you, Mr. Operating officer, Chief Operating <laughs> Officer. <laughs> Wasn't trying to say anything, but you no, can't hear what's you. going thank on you. back no, there. No, that's fine. That's perfect. Okay. Uh, Richard McNeil, and I'm here to represent myself and the retirement group. Uh, I will say that uh, Dave Brown, who was here, was our vice president of our group and uh, uh, doing very well. Um, from the retirement group, we are having our uh, fall meeting next Wednesday. Uh, at Centerville Methodist Church. If anybody can, would like to attend, just let me know. We'll, we'll provide food for you this time anyway. Um, and uh, one of our community service projects, we do one for every meeting. Uh, we will be decorating uh, pumpkins that we deliver to people who are ill, nursing homes, uh, that kind of a thing. Uh, I just picked up 30, so they're in my garage right now, just sitting there looking like nice orange pumpkins. So we'll be decorating those. Um, I would like to um, uh, make an announcement. The ALS walk is October the 20th, which is a Sunday. And um, I know that this goes out to the community also. One of our uh, former teachers at Centerville Elementary School and guidance counselor, Pam Edwards, is being challenged by ALS. And this is uh, the ALS walk out to the 4-H park has been organized by her daughters and other members of our uh, community. And uh, I think it would be really wonderful if we could get level, several members from the board, from teachers um, and from the community to come out this one time um, she's the second employee who have come down with ALS and, and, and uh, 
uh, Mr. Shippel was uh, the first one several years ago. And um, so uh, uh, I did talk with her so I can use her name. So I didn't want to do that. So Pam Evers, come out and support her on the 20th ALS walk, if you can, 10 o'clock. Um, we have a great time out there and celebrating. Um, the last thing I want to say is just a, a kind of a big thank you to all the teachers and staff for their response so nobody would lose their jobs. And I know it was tough times for you all as far as finances, but uh, to me, they came through in that aspect to, to do that, at least as far as I know anyway. And, you know, we, I've never known a, um, a teacher or somebody who works in a school who won't do something to help somebody else. I mean, that's part of our, our nature on that part. And I just hope that through all of this, that as contracts and negotiations come in the spring, that all of this will be reminded and supportive. I know it's tough times and maybe some hurt feelings have been made, but you know we are in this together. So thank you for my time. Thank you. Coral Adams. Coral Adams, Southersville, Maryland. I'm coming today as a parent. Um, the board that's seated in front of me has made several decisions over this year that are very concerning to me as a parent with students in the elementary schools. I've sent several emails to all five of you with my concerns and questions, and I've received zero feedback or responses from anyone, which is very, very concerning to me because you're sitting on your dais and you're making decisions that impact my children's education, that impact other people significantly more than they impact you personally. And you can't even be bothered to respond to the emails from the constituents who voted you into these seats. So I sincerely hope that the people that are running in November for these seats, please plan on answering emails. Since some of you won't be here after November, I don't really know how relevant it is to speak to you anymore. But I hope that the people that will be will respond to parent emails, especially when you're making decisions that are continually deteriorating a school system. I moved back to Queen Anne's County because of the school system. I'm ready to take my kids out of here. This is ridiculous. The lack of, uh, the lack of assistance, the deterioration of, accom of accommodations and remediation for students at the lowest level is absolutely abhorrent. The fact that teachers were given a completely new system of, to teach with zero minimal training, no formal training at all on the uh, remediation programs that they're teaching, very little informal training, and yet we are sitting here in 2024 building the plane in the air, much like you asked us to do in 2020. But we don't have a, a national a pandemic going on. We have a budget crisis that was created by the people in this room who are unwilling to take responsibility and very willing to talk about how the state is doing this and not willing to even bother to respond to your constituents. That is abhorrent. Do better. Amanda and Cassandra. Amanda and Cassandra, Centerville, Centerville Elementary. I was here just last month and when I explained to my daughter why I was here in bite-sized portions, she wanted to come and say something herself. I was hesitant to let her do it, but I believe in the power of allowing a child to voice what they need to, especially when it directly impacts her. I will say you're correct when you say that there is misunderstanding, there are people who don't understand the problems with the budget or who don't understand how a capital budget should be spent or this or that. But none of that is solved without the back and forth that we cannot do in this room. I came here last month and I asked a bunch of questions 
and I left you with my contact emails. And much like the woman who spoke before me, radio silence, nothing in response. I am taking time out of my day and I am taking time away from my children to be here to speak, to advocate for them and their teachers and their support staff. And I expect an answer because I, I am not from here. I am from New Jersey, so help me. Like, I want an answer when I ask a question. And as a female who worked her way up in a somewhat sexually biased industry by myself with male peers, when I do not find answers to my questions by simply asking them, I find a way to get myself a seat at the table. It is too late for me to run at this point. I think I could do a write-in ballot and that's about it, but it involves a lot of work. But it is not something I am opposed to doing if it means that I get the answers to the questions I want and not blanket <coughs> statements of pointing fingers at the state with no direct names and at a CFO who used to work here when in fact, if the CFO missed a page off of the whole budget, it was my presumption, my understanding, maybe my misunderstanding, that the entire board reviews that budget before it's put through. And when I worked in business and finances, I could not ever dream of handing my boss financial documentation with an entire page missing and not find out about it for, what was it, a year ago? Two years? That would have got me fired very quickly. I will leave it at that. Cassandra? I don't want you to get rid of the teachers because they're important for everybody and everybody needs them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Julia George. Good morning, um, superintendent and board and board members. I'm speaking today about my feelings regarding a general policy of non-duty days off. I want to explain the history because I've lived it. I've been working here for, since 1984 and the perspective of myself and many other employees. And I've created a dramatization to try to explain our perspective and our feelings. It's an every man's tale. Um, this is a morality play and it tells a story that has an underlying message. This message is about fair play and inequity. The main character of the story is nurse every man. And in this case, that nurse represents all 207 day employees who are affected by this non-duty day policy and the changes in the non-duty day policy and the policy that's been in effect for the last 35 years. The title is Who Owes Who? A Story of Three Free Days, circa 1989. Employer, nurse every man we need all 207 day employees, including you, to show up three days early at the start of the school year. Nurse, oh, okay, three extra days pay, sounds good. No, no, nurse every man, we are paying the teachers three extra days to come back and work early for us on Monday instead of Thursday. But you and your employees on 207 day pay that come in on Thursday, you're gonna come in three days Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and we're not paying you, but we'll give you days off. Oh, okay, three extra days. I'll have comp days. I can take them off and do things that I need to do during the year. Oh no, I don't think you understand, nurse every man. You're not gonna pick the days that you take off, your three comp days, as you wanna call them. We're gonna tell you when the three days are that you get to take off. It'll be at our convenience. Oh my, oh wow. You want me to come in and not get paid for three days and you don't wanna give me three days of comp time that I can take off when I want to? No, I'd much rather have my original summer break and have my last three days to enjoy. 
Oh, no, 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 no. You don't understand, nurse every man. We're not telling you that you can come in. We're, um, excuse me. We're not asking you if you wanna come in. We're telling you, you must come in. We've changed the way you're gonna work. This is now how you're gonna work. You don't get a choice. You're gonna come in and work three extra days. And then we will tell you when you have days off, it might be at the end of the year. It might be the very last day that you even work that we give you as a day off. Okay, we will we'll call these the three non-duty days forevermore. See you Monday. That's the end of the story. As you can see, back in 1989, there was no precedence or allowance for bargaining on the behalf of Eastern Shore I'm sorry. educational that, that employees. Was your, time, your time was yes. three minutes. I will email you okay. the rest of my statement. Thank you. I appreciate you for listening. And I hope that gives you some idea of what we're working with here. Thank you. Yeah. Michelle M. Michelle? Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. I hope you guys are having a good night. I um, am Michelle uh, Messier. I'm the school nurse over at Ken Island High School. I am here to talk about the non-duty days as well um, and the recent notification that we received that uh, Typical past practice, when we came in early, we were given three full seven hour days to compensate for the three full seven hour days that we came in. Uh, notification was that we were not going to be able to receive three full seven hour days, but yet a fragmented piecemeal of hours put together over half days that we already had to come in for was going to be our compensation or instead of pay for those three days. Um, when we come in for work, we are using gas money, we are using our time that we can do other necessary things that we have in our life. We are putting mileage on our cars um, and past practice, we had three full days. We didn't come in, we didn't use gas, we didn't use time and we were allotted that. Um, so I, find issue with that. Um, I know this year is incredibly difficult because of the time constraints that are put on the calendar, but um, there's gotta be a better way. Uh, additionally, in past practice, these non-duty days um, are not usually given or told or, or made aware to us until after the school year begins. It's my request that these non-duty days could be informed to us when the calendar is approved for the upcoming school year, which is in the spring, um, so that we can plan accordingly what we have to do in our lives. Um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm sorry. That's the last one. All right. Thank you very much. All right, can I get a motion to approve the HR report as presented? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, Mr. Bearclaw, you are up first and second and third. Good evening, President Bennett, Vice President Bent, board members, Superintendent Salins, executive team. My name is Daryl Barraclo. I'm the supervisor of facilities and design. Uh, up on the agenda for the first item is the uh, approval of the comprehensive maintenance plan that was presented last, uh, last month. Um, no changes or revisions or additions were made to that. So we're asking for approval so we can submit that to the state before the deadline. Are there any other questions any qu or comments? Mm -mm. I think a motion to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Next. 
Okay, next item up is the presentation of the uh, FY 2026 capital improvement plan. The capital improvement plan is required by Comar to be prepared each year, uh, presented to the board for approval. The board must approve it and then the uh, uh, LEA submits it to the state for their review and consideration of state funded projects. We have two different types of projects that we typically encounter each year. We have uh, state funded, uh, which are um, partially state funded, um, partially local funded. Uh, those are typically projects uh, greater than $200,000. Uh, they are your, your new schools, replacement schools, renovation, additions, systemic renovations, and those sorts of things. Um, those are the projects that we are presenting this evening. We also have uh, local or minor projects. Uh, those are 100% locally funded projects. They'll typically involve things like interior adjustments, vestibule reconfigurations, playgrounds, technology upgrades, site paving, those sorts of things. Those costs can vary greatly uh, from uh, $50,000 on upwards to a uh, million dollars. Those projects are 100% locally funded and we will be back before the board uh, sometime later this year to present just the locally funded projects. Those projects, we get a lot of input from uh, teaching staff and, and administrators and that sort of thing. So we put that together throughout throughout the, the rest of the school uh, throughout the rest of this year. Um, as far as uh, cost share, uh, just as it was last year, uh, the, the state share for uh, state funded projects remains at a 50-50 split between local participation and state participation. Those uh, figures will be up for review next year, and several things come into play for each county, things like um, free and reduced lunch percentages, unemployment rates, uh, per capita income, and, and population growth. Um, for our FY26 uh, projects, we are requesting state funding for five projects. The uh, priority one project is the Mattapeak Elementary School partial roof replacement. This would be the replacement of the asphalt shingled uh, steeper slope roof sections on that school. Uh, the uh, roof is in need of repair. Um, it gets a lot of abuse just from its proximity to the uh, Chesapeake Bay with the winds and the salt air. Uh, next on the agenda, or next on the uh, list of state funded projects is Kennard Elementary School HVA systemic renovation. This would address portions of the school that were uh, taken care of back in the 2001 renovation. We'd be replacing rooftops, through wall units, and uh, other, other units to bring that system up to current code requirements. Third on the list is a project that uh, was sought several years ago, uh, but really didn't have the funding supplied to it. And that was the Bayside Elementary School storefront replacement. Uh, storefront is uh, another fancy name for the aluminum entrances that you see on the front of uh, most of the commercial type entrances. It's the aluminum frame with, with full glass doors and that sort of thing. That is um, in need of serious repair and re actually replacement at Bayside. Um, maintenance will go out and do an adjustment to a door that's sagging and dragging on a door frame that's, that's difficult to open and, and won't close sometimes. And the very next day, that door will be back out of adjustment. Just to, the hardware is worn out. The aluminum frames are worn out. So this project would replace uh, all of the aluminum windows and the aluminum doors on the exterior of that building and bring it up to current energy standards as well. Can I ask a question about the aluminum though? I mean, that's such a lightweight. I mean, do we feel that that's the best replacement if it's always, is it out of whack always just because of the hardware or is it because of what the material is? It, it, it's, it's seen its useful life. It's, it's over 20 years old. Well, so. right, so I'm just wondering if we want, it's I, just aluminum seems like a weird choice for something that we want to be solid and not moving. It, it's actually pretty okay. standard from a, okay. from a commercial application. I mean, it, it's the same sort of entrances that you're gonna see on the front of CVS or going into the, the grocery store or whatever the case. It's, it, it is a pretty standard commercial 
commercial. Okay. And the other nice side of, uh, about it is, is that it doesn't require a lot of uh, maintenance from an aesthetic standpoint. It doesn't require painting or it doesn't subject itself too badly to things like salt that gets put down for, for snow and ice and that sort of thing. So it is, it is a pretty, pretty robust okay. Thank material. You. Any other questions on that? No, I can just make a comment. I mean, like when we look at our schools, it's completely different than a house or even a small office building because it's almost like a Walmart. People are constantly going in, in and out every day. So I, I think there's a lot of use. And just as a fact, that's right there for 26. You're talking 6.5, a little under $6.5 million local funding. Um, and we have to remember, depending on the commissioners, that can move sometimes on different things. Correct. But, uh, you know, that's just another number that is going into this system to maintain our buildings, which I think we keep them in great shape. You know, I mean, I, I really do, but it's, it's, a, it's a big number. And there's a couple of roof replacements, not like, I guess the roofs will be done the same as we did Ken Island and Queen Anne's in the, that's what we'd be looking uh, in the summertime. It's a summertime project for those, yes. Um, and, and moving on, well, and back to the, um, the Bayside um, storefront, there are things that, um, would be done to help improve the longevity of that with some some different hardware uses um, things like providing continuous gear hinges versus normal uh, standard hinges like you would see on commercial and residential doors a continuous hinge is gonna gonna wear a lot better it's gonna it, it's gonna sustain 25 30 years of service life so that, that those would be the things that we would look to employ for especially all the exterior doors that, that see a lot of continuous use throughout the day um, moving on um, canard elementary school is the fourth uh, the fourth priority that is a complete uh, roof replacement of the spaces that were done in 2001 that would not include uh, the gymnasium area or I'm sorry the cafeteria area that was done recently as well as the uh, classroom ad classroom and media center addition that was done towards the back of the school those areas would not be re-roofed as, as part of this scope and the reason why they would not be included in this is that they would not uh, receive state participation because of the, the uh, how recently they were done and they did receive state funding previously for those projects um, last on the list is the Kent Island Elementary School fire alarm project um, that project um, is similar to two high that um, high school. High school. school it's actually the elementary school I'm sorry it, it that was a typo and I, oh. I, I actually corrected it between between uh, the oh, between what I provided you guys earlier and, and what I'm presenting tonight I, I uh, that was brought to my attention so it the uh, the high schools were uh, high school was done about three years ago so this is the elementary school my apologies for any confusion on that so that wraps up the uh, FY 2026 uh, funding requests and if we go to the next slide it's probably going to be a little difficult to read but in the uh, the CIP booklet that you received it would be pages 24 through 28 um, some of the key projects to point out on that um, uh, is is going to be FY 27 we would be requesting the uh, first year of construction funding for Centerville Middle School uh, moving on to 28 that would be the second year of uh, construction funding for Centerville Middle School and in FY 28 we, we would be seeking design funding for, uh, for potentially the CTE or the Career Technology Education Center and 29 we would be seeking the first year of construction funding for the CTE building 30 you would see the 30 you would see the second year and then 31 is made up predominantly of all systemic projects and we do have systemic projects kind of scattered in throughout some of those uh, other 27 through 31 years as well any questions on any of those projects the cost share between the state and the county um, so for like where you have 2027 and 2028 for Centerville where it says IAC approval for both um, is there a threshold we have to meet to get that approval 
Are, are you speaking for, for from like a replacement project? Yeah, so where it says Centerville Middle School renovation or replacement for 27 and then again for 28. Yes, um, so so uh, they break the funding up in two years because the project will, will extend over mu multiple years through construction. But as far as what we get funding-wise from the state, these numbers are approximate based upon what current formulas are are being driven right now through enrollment and those sorts of things. Um, the state funds based on what enrollments are at that point in time when the funding is approved. Um, right now, um, funding with, uh, I'm sorry, right now enrollment at um, Centerville Middle with the fifth grade transitioning over from Kennard to Centerville tracks almost to the T of what the existing state rated capacity of that building is. So right now, if you were to take a snapshot right now, the funding looks pretty much like it does right here on this picture. If our enrollment drops or it increases, it's going to fluctuate. It's going to bounce those numbers a little bit. Okay, so we're on track to get there by those dates, but it may or may not, it may change depending on... It may or may not change, and it also depends upon the state approving this overall because okay. it, they're they're dealing with all the other counties in the state and they so nobody is getting it but they, it might not get approved anyway okay and as a matter of fact i'm i've we have um, monthly meetings with other leas in the state and um, we're hearing that several leas were funded for a project the first year but the state has backed out of funding it the second year and I've not seen that before. I've never encountered that in, in, in a county that I've worked in, but um, that I don't know how counties are, are managing that sort of problem. And that's 50-50 for state and county for the call share? It is for us. Other counties are funded differently, and, and that was back on one of the previous slides, and it, it depends on okay. a lot of different factors. But the minimum is 50%. Okay. So all this may change. It's just a draft. It may change if we were not to get approval for this. It, it, it would change if we don't get approval for it. And the numbers are going to change slightly for uh, as as we present each year, the numbers are going to change slightly and the projects are going to shift differently. If you remember um, last year's CIP um, included uh, programming for uh, high school additions because that's what we were we were tracking at at over a hundred percent enrollment for the two high schools so we were we had program costs in later years for doing feasibility studies design and additions to the to the two high schools um, that programmatically changed when we started looking at a CTE because the CTE would pull some of that enrollment and give them some flexibility with their spaces that they currently utilize for their CTE programs like at, at Queen Anne's County High School. Okay, thank you. Sure. When I'm looking at these numbers, I see the CTE building or school in time will cost more than a middle school. Yes. It has include a lot of the interior stuff and what we're doing with the CTE programs and stuff. I'm, I'm thinking, of, I know an office building is different than a school, but the CT is going to be that much more than a middle school. That's what we're programming it at right now. And again, it's going to be formula driven and, and the and the state's going to pay us what they're or give us what they're what they're going to give us. Um, but that's what I've seen tracking with other CTE. They are more expensive. Um, they, they cost more from a uh, electrical standpoint because the the you know the electrical systems that for welding programs for example for automotive sections those sorts of programs are, are much more heavily uh, driven from a uh, from an infrastructure standpoint so they are more expensive to construct from the ground up any other questions for the CTE um, is that something with the blueprint that they is there like a set number that they have to provide or is that still the same way? It's all up in the air for approval. It's it's driven again by by formulas, and um, if you look at the um, some of the, we don't have any this year because we're not asking for any construction funding. 
but in prior years CIP there is there's a, a multiple page state form that you have to fill out what the enrollment uh, enrollments were for the last few years and then you do the projections and then it drives it drives the, the, the money formula that way. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any other questions? That's, a motion? that's, that's the slide that I'm on is questions, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, motion to uh, approve the fiscal year 2026 CIP request for submission to the state uh, AIC, I, IAC. All so those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, thank you. Okay. All right. Last four approvals is the replacement of the two to five year old playground at Sudlersville Elementary School. Um, we have been in contact with Game Time Care of Cunning Cunningham Recreation to pr to provide a replacement playground for the existing two to five year old playground at Sudlersville Elementary School. Utilizing the uh, Omnia contract 2017001134, uh, Game Time uh, Cunningham Recreation has proposed a replacement cost of $349,998.37. Uh, um, a little bit of background on the project. Um, we've met several times uh, with Cunningham on site as well as um, County Parks and Rep. Uh, park, parks and Rec representatives to discuss how the scope of the project would would um, would go. Parks and Rec has agreed to come out and do the demolition of the existing uh, playground and uh, bring the uh, playground area up to or down to the subgrade that it needs to be and take care of all of the haul off. That basically provides us with a little bit of. Uh, a little bit more room in the budget for the equipment and those sorts of things as opposed to having the contractor do that. Um, a little bit of background on game time and Cunningham recreation. Um, one of the uh, most significant reasons why we're utilizing game time for this is, is that uh, all of the recent, and when I say recent, I'm going back to probably the last 15 years worth of playgrounds has been constructed utilizing game time in Cunningham. Um, what that provides for the county parks and rec who maintain and service all of our equipment, that provides them with continuity of the equipment continuity of any interchangeable parts that may need to happen, as well as dealing with one service vendor if they have an issue with a piece of equipment or need parts or anything like that. And it is a, a vendor who has been around a, a very long time and, and they're, uh, you know, we're not going to get into an issue with having a playground that's installed and, um, you know, a company might go out of business or be bought out and then parts, replacement parts um, aren't available. Replacement parts are sought every year for different playgrounds, whether it's due to just normal attrition of a, of a playground to everything uh, dealing with even vandalism at some of our schools. So they, they do require replacement parts annually at, at schools. Any questions on the quote? What's the life expectancy of a playground, an elementary school playground? About 25 years, Five. 20 to 25 years. And do they do any kind of like maintenance or check up on anything or is that um, as a matter of fact, I just had a meeting with uh, the representative from Game Time up at the playground uh, at Church Hill that they just replaced last year. Um, they were looking at the uh, play surface out there that we have some concerns. I don't, I don't want to call them issues, but they're just leaving a little bit of a black surface on, on kids' clothes and knees and those sorts of things that they're looking at. So from a service and, and warranty standpoint, they have no quarrel at all with them. Yeah. I would just always would like to see other, you know, people bidding. Um, I, I don't know if there's, I've been to a lot of the schools and I don't know if I've seen the exact same equipment at each school. So it seemed like whatever vendor, you could just get the parts from whatever vendor. But I'm looking at the installation of the above materials and it's almost $70,000. Do we have a breakdown of, of how that 70,000 is going to be used? Is that just man hours of just actual manual labor that is yeah i mean it, it's it's their installation cost that's what they're they're paying for 
the, the physical labor to do the work. All of the material costs are broken down on the, the, the three right. three separate pages that, that are in there from a quote. So it's six so seventy thousand dollars to to install the materials and then we're paying another sixty, seventy, seventy five thousand for installing the the flooring. Correct. Now on on that um, Regarding, uh, for example, if we were to bid this project out, um, we would not be we would not be guaranteed getting game time for for a um, for a manufacturer, which means that we're, we're not again going back to that continuity of manufacturers. I, I look at it kind of similar to what we do from a Johnson Control standpoint when we look at building controls and those sorts of things. When we start introducing these other systems into the school, it just creates. It creates a lot of additional effort from maintenance from maintenance's standpoint in, in the case of Johnson Controls. In this case, it would be Parks and Rec. Parks and Rec uh, comes out and does annual inspections on these uh, playgrounds, and when items do fall out of uh, or fall into disrepair, then they're contacting manufacturers. If if a manufacturer goes out of business and a piece of playground equipment isn't available any longer, that whole piece of equipment is going to be taken out of service. So, and they are within budget. I mean, they, they are within the budget that we set on the project. Any other questions? I get a motion. I'm sorry, did you have something, Alexis? Oh, no, I okay. just said no. Thank you. <laughs> All right, motion that the board approve the contract with Game Time, care of Cunningham Recreation, to provide and install the two to five year old playground at Sutlerville Elementary School. In the amount of three hundred forty-nine thousand nine hundred ninety-eight point thirty-seven cents. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Our next three. I don't know if we want to just get a motion to approve all three. It was a non-public tuition payments. Can we get a motion to to approve the three that were presented to us? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. All right, uh, our added piece was the um, insulin litigation class action. Dr. Samuels, did you want to kind of speak about that or not? Or do we, what, did I miss something again? I thought we added it to 8.07. Well, we said 6 I, I thought it was 6.08 action item. Action. action. Oh, item. sorry, sorry, sorry. That's okay. Okay. So, <laughs> it's so um, many districts um, and other organizations who insure employees have um, started to engage with a new mass lawsuit um, going after companies for gouging as it relates to insulin. So insulin typically um, fairly should be about $35 per vial. Um, vial. Said, yes. And um, they have been charging upwards to almost 1,000 depending on where you are. And so as a school district who ensures our employees we've had to bear those costs that were inflated um, due to price gouging. So um, we, are, we have asked the board to review that in closed session with attorneys to see what that um, risk would be uh, and knowing that there is no risk to the district of any cost whatsoever unless there are funds that are received in a settlement, then Obviously, there's a MOU where the attorneys would get a portion of those um, proceeds that come back to the district. But if there's no monies that are recovered, the district is not responsible for any money whatsoever. So it, it really is just a pure win for us. And I believe it's the right thing to do. Um, it's very similar to the other um, the mass thing. action um, on social media. It's very similar to that. although. The one difference is, is that you can literally calculate exactly how much it's cost the district, where in social media, it's hard to predict exactly the damages that are there. So I think that's the only real difference. But similarly, there's absolutely no risk to the board. Um, and only if there's monies received through the litigation will that benefit us. So um, that's my recommendation for the board to discuss and to vote um, mm -hmm. to either join the mass um, lawsuit action or to not. Thank you. Did anyone else have any other questions? I know we spoke with the attorneys we, earlier, we've, we've but we wanted to vote it. on it in public. 
I don't think I get a motion to join the class action lawsuit regarding the insulin. And I think it was also GL1. There were other drugs as well. There so are, it wasn't yes. just insulin. Yes. But, right. Okay. Insulin was the main and the, yeah. the, the reason that it all started. Yeah. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And Aye. also, like, I will move forward with, with when we move forward with that, if Dr. Salins could contact the county, because they are with our insurance company Absolutely. or with us, to uh, advise them of what we're doing and uh, offer them. They're, they can join make the decision in. if they'd like to join or not. I'd be happy to do that. As a matter of fact, the commissioners mm -hmm. have a meeting coming up um, early next week. Mm -hmm. So maybe they will take the opportunity to vote themselves and choose and they to join can, And they, we can get the contact of the law firm we're talking to, or sure. you could just give them a presentation on Great. what's happening. Happy to, happy to do that. Great idea. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Mr. Evans. So patient back there. <laughs> Good evening, President Bennett, Dr. Salins, members of the Board Executive Committee. For the record, my name is Matt Evans, Supervisor of Student Services. Before you tonight is the second read for Policy 528, Title IX. The updates in this policy reflect the amendments released by the U.S. Department of Education in April of 2024. To date, there are no comments. Right. Any no questions? comments? No questions on the second read? Yeah, I got a couple questions. Sure. Uh, first, under definitions, uh, subparagraph A. I know when you're there. Yes, sex discrimination? Right. So, sex based harassment, <clears throat> it says unwelcome conduct of a sexual nature, including unwelcome sex based conduct. We understand what that is. Then you continue on, comma, sex stereotypes, comma, sexual orientation and gender identity. But there's, it doesn't make sense if you look at that. In other words, there's a verb missing or something. So unwelcome conduct of a sexual nature, including unwelcome sex-based conduct. So there's conduct, there's an action verb, right? Or a noun, I guess, conduct. But then it just goes on to sex stereotypes. So I'm not sure what is trying to be said here. In other words, unwelcome conduct of a sexual nature, sex stereotypes. There's no sex stereotyping, maybe? It could be. And I, but I mean, so I think I, it needs uh, to be looked at because it doesn't make sense. Sure. Um, and I did work on this in, in consultation with, with Mr. Constance, and I'm happy to... Yeah, yeah, just bring it up because it doesn't. Okay. It doesn't. The grammar, the syntax, I'm not an English uh, teacher, but there's something wrong there. The other thing is. Okay, uh, subparagraph four, sec under the same uh, paragraph A, number four sexual orientation and gender identity. Discrimination against individuals based on their actual or perceived sexual orientation or gender identity. So it's the second time you mentioned gender identity, but there's no definition of gender identity in the policy. So obviously, breaking policies has consequences or can have consequences. And if employees, teachers, students are going to be held to some kind of standard, they need that definition. So I'll, um, again, consult with Mr. Constance and come up with a definition for gender identity. Yeah, I mean, there's definitions out there. And if you take a look at it, you're going to see that gender identity is very subjective, extremely subjective. It's based on the, the person, uh, their opinion of their sexual orientation or sexual identity, their sex, et cetera, uh, or their gender, of which apparently there can be many in the uh, popular uh, notion of this and I think we got to be careful because when it says perceived sexual identity of the, the of the person the subject right who could be the complainant um, it's very vague what that means and if you look just yesterday there was a $575,000 uh, lawsuit from the Virginia Supreme Court an award to a teacher who was fired for refusing to use a student's gender specific pronoun. As we know, there's like zero self and pure self, these words that are fabricated uh, 
on college campuses and, and that sort of thing. So I just think we've got to be really careful. And I'd like to talk to uh, Adam about this to make sure we're going down the right road because we don't want to set up our teachers for failure or even worse, uh, get in a lawsuit by a teacher who's been reprimanded <clears throat> for uh, gender identity <coughs> discrimination because he or she refused to uh, recognize the student's uh, preferred pronoun or, or what have you. So it's a very sticky situation. Unfortunately, schools are in this situation. In May, there was a $250,000 award from uh, Ohio court, same thing. A uh, female teacher was fired uh, for refusing to use a student's uh, pronoun, preferred pronoun. So uh, I think it deserves that everybody take a look at this um, and, and I'll reach out to Constance. And, uh, but in the meantime, if you're gonna use gender identity, you need to have a definition in there. Okay. All right. Other questions? Thank you. Anything else? Nope. All right. Let's move on to first read of policy 640. Policy 640, uh, student nutrition, health, and wellness first read. This was updated based on the review from the state of the policy and our triennial, triennial that we submitted. Um, the only update was they wanted to specifically say how the public will access or where the public can, can get this information. So we, as you see in red, um, made it clear that the public can, it would be made available to the public on our website, qacps.org. Where would they find that under? I know that I sometimes, when I'm on the website, have challenges trying to find specific. I mean, I know this is a policy and we have our policy section, but this will not be our policy. You're saying that they need to find information about the triennial because, assessment data report. Right. Because it's not in front of me, I want to say operations, but it could be under student support as well. I, I, I don't know. Okay, so they said they're not saying we have to make it easy for them to find it, but we just have to make it to the right Okay. I yes. Have, yeah. Well, and, and, and I go to the policy page a lot, so there's, what, six different subheadings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, normally, I'm going to student support. I don't believe it's there. I think it's under operations. Okay. But if we were to type in, I know that that's sometimes helpful. If you just type in that triennial yes. data access, that would come up. Is that? Right? Yes. All right. Thank you. Any other questions about 640? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, school safety update. Mr. Saburi. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening, uh, Ms. Bennett and Ms. Bent, uh, board members and executive team members. Wish I could appear with better news, but the Orioles are down two to one in the seventh right now. So, um, Luckily, some of us don't care. that's disheartening. Uh, I'm actually here to talk about a uh, grant that was recently uh, written by the district, uh, and it's actually good news. On July 29th, uh, just a couple months ago, our district applied for a grant funding through the Maryland Center for School Safety SRO Adequate Coverage Grant. Um, this funding allows the local school district to hire an SSE or a school security employee under the um, the grant falls under the 2018 Maryland Safe to Learn Act. Uh, and with this grant funding, our district has funding, funding to pursue the hiring of a school safety employee. <coughs> so school safety employees are individuals who are not SROs, they're not school resource officers. They're employed by the LEA to provide safety and security related services at a public school. They are required, they're held to the same standards uh, through a certification program through the Maryland Center for School Safety model training. The MCSS supports the creation of a diverse school safety and security teams that include both SROs and SSEs, school safety employees, as each provide opportunities for strong connections with students, caregivers, and school personnel. As an employee of the LEA, the SSE works closely with school-based leaders on safety and security measures, often outside law enforcement scope. The SSE can be closely involved in student behavior, support, and providing interventions to prevent, mitigate, and restore harm, and something that, that an SRO can't really do given their law enforcement responsibilities. So provides us with a lot of really great leverage. A little bit about the grant funding. Um, 
The funding will assist in providing adequate law enforcement coverage for public schools uh, from 10 to $15 million in FY26 and 20 million in FY27 and each year thereafter. Uh, and as of August the 9th, 19th, QACPS was awarded $70,000 to pursue the hiring of the district's first school security employee. So we got the grant for the one year. So would they know that that's, that's it? It could be if we don't get continued he grant. Said, he just said it was $15 million this year guaranteed and oh, that's 20 million us. next okay. year. So we no, don't it's for the whole state, but, okay. but that means it's secure because it's not only is it, they've already put it in the budget, but they're increasing it as well. So okay. next year, likely we can apply for more money. Um, but it looks like a minimum it's secure for three full years following this year. Correct. But okay. yeah. I would assume because it's school safety that they're not going to try to chop into right. those funds. I was just concerned because so. I know with our more grant, we have to keep applying to get mm -hmm. these grants. And well, we definitely have to continue to apply. But we think that um, but but we it's almost solid. like a guarantee. OK, right. That it is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, the governor signed Senate Bill 1077 with amendments. That's really going to kind of keep this funding in place. Not only that, historically, that funding was only really slotted for uh, you know, it was kind of the, the local LEA would kind of hold it and then we would, through an MOU with the sheriff's office or local police department, we would filter money to them to provide their SROs into our schools. This gives us the ability to hire our own school security employees through this grant funding that we can use to supplement the school resource officers that are already in place. So really that's putting additional eyes and ears in our schools, which is a wonderful thing. With the increase in funding, I'm hoping that we can continue to build on this to create a safer environment for our students to learn. So we don't, I mean, we have SRs and assigned to every school and everywhere, but if you then would have somebody, you could double up on something if we had issues, something. Well, and that's the goal is if, if we have an issue at a school um, or a perceived issue at a school, then we could allocate this one person right now, hopefully more in the future with the grant funding, um, to be that extra set of eyes and ears. Typically, I'm there as well if we're anticipating something. Um, but we have the flexibility with them being our employee to use them for after school sporting events, to use them to send them on field trips, to use them for a school that may be anticipating problems, that there's a, the social media craziness that's going on. Um, so really it gives us a lot of flexibility to kind of point them towards if there's going to be problems after a football game or during a football game. So that's a, it's a great resource that the school district's never had before. So of our, n n there's not, there's no school, but certain times you have certain areas that you go to a school and there's an issue. No, no, no. no we could send, we could send this employee with our teams on an away game or something. Absolutely. And it's just in, in fact um, part of the so the 70,000 part of that will go towards uh, so I set aside an allocation for overtime because I know there's going to be times like tonight where they'll come in and meet all of you um, <laughs> I'm sure they'll volunteer to do that like I do um, or there's other times that we may need to pay them overtime so that's built in their training um, their clothing, their clothing or uniforms and equipment, all of that is budgeted in. It's not going to cost anybody any money. It's all grant funded. Um, the grant funding for this school district is based on total number of school buildings. So we do get a decent uh, allocation or stipend from the, the, you know, $15 million in 26, 20 million in 27 and, and for each year thereafter. Um, we look for that grant funding to increase with these additional awards uh, and hopefully enough for us to continue to build on this program. I have to say I've been very impressed with all the grants we've received and, and I assume you find them and I think we utilize a grant writer through the county to actually write them, but very impressed with what no, we've we, been able to do. we write them You write them? Yeah, I've been very impressed all. with how much we've been able to get done and do and have as a result of that, so thank you for your We efforts. do have a grant manager in the district yeah. um, who oversees all of our grants, um, and we do kudos to the staff because mm -hmm. yeah. um, they're always out there trying to get additional. Um, if, it, if there's one to be had, we'll, we'll write for it. We might not get it, but we're, mm -hmm. we're going to try. I appreciate those So the bottom line, this is a state grant. It's definitely good for three years, and it's probably going to be a longer. 
Correct. Yeah. And uh, we're, from and we're 10 gonna... to 15 million in FY26 and uh, to 20 million in FY27 and that 20 million mark for each year thereafter. So it's 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 it's, it's not going it's away. But when you say tw that's a state 20 million that's grant, yeah, 70,000 is allocated does at the present time. Correct. Yes. Yes. So we're going to basically be able to have one probably one officer or SOR whatever you want to call them. SSE. 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 Each, yeah, each well, year. And, and next year, as the at five million, you know, they're adding five million dollars. I don't know what that yeah. could be enough to be able to do too. We we won't know until yeah, next year. That we pencil. See that. Well, and you know, that's certainly a conversation that I, that I would not to put the the cart too far before the horse here. Um, you know, school safety and security is paramount because no one can learn in a building that's not safe. So. I would love the opportunity to, to share some of this information with our commissioners and, and hopefully that we can continue to build this program up. Right now it's gonna be standing on its own two legs under grant funding, which, is, which I think is incredible. It, it's gonna do so for many years to come. Um, but as you know, we, we wanna be sure that our kids are learning and, and learning safely. So um, whatever that takes, uh, I'm willing to put the time in to make sure that we get to where we need to be. You know, I've said it before, I, I feel very confident in our system and our schools are very safe. I got grandkids here and I you don't, I mean, you worry about everybody all the time, but I think we do a good job. And I tell you, I give you kudos to teaching our staff, our board, and even everybody that's involved, eyes, talk, you know, yes. communicate. And that makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Calm, stay calm. Yes. <laughs> teachings. All right, any other questions? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so Go O's. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mr. Grow. Back row. Even back row. <laughs> Had to walk all this way. All right. Good evening, President Bennett, Dr. Salins, members of the board, executive team. Uh, for the record, my name is John Groh, Supervisor of Accountability. I am here tonight to present uh, what we've been calling the... Let me help you out there, bud. There we go. Uh, the State of the Data Review um, for all of our MCAP data. So I'm going to... That's just what I just said. So I'm going to dive right into our ELA results um, from 23-24. Uh, this slide right here, uh, we start with ELA. This is all students right now. So in blue right there, you'll see Queen Anne's. Uh, the proficiency level was 58.5. Um, going back, looking at all of our MCAPs, our um, intervals that we're looking at, our, our scales is from a 650 to an 850 with 750 being that proficient score. Um, so we're looking at, out of four, we're looking at levels three and four for being proficient. Um, so 58.5% being proficient um, this year with Queen Anne uh, ranking sixth in the state um, for ELA. Um, last year we were five, um, six this year just by another um, percent and a half. Uh, these next few slides, I know the numbers get a little bit small, um, but I'll kind of uh, explain what I'm looking at when I when I do look at these. Um, this one here kind of um, expands that last slide where it looks at each level, level one, two, three, and four for the count of students, and then also the percent proficient in each of those levels. So I'm gonna kind of use my cursor here. So like in level four right here, you'll see like those in four, we had 8.1% um, that received a four. And then once you look under a three, we had 50.4 to make up our 58.5. So the majority of our proficiencies are in that, in that three, but then I'm really looking over the state also where that's kind of a trend of, of across all, all of these districts also. So when we talk to our schools, when we talk to our curriculum, our administrative teams, our teachers, um, you know, we always look between the lines of, of where they are. We're looking at, you remember last year we started talking about cusp um, with all of those students within 10 um, proficient uh, points or, or percentages. Um, and I'll get to a slide on that uh, later. 
but we try to look in between there. We're always trying to move to the next level. So we're looking to move those threes to fours, but especially those twos to threes um, for that proficiency level. Um, so that's really where we're paying attention once we actually break down all this data afterwards. Um, this also goes forward with the next two slides. It'll break it down from grades three to five in our elementaries, and then also six to eight for our middle schools. So it's kind of the same thing where we're looking at the overall number and the proficiencies across each of those levels. And that was this uh, six to eight. Um, overall, so taking all of that and throwing it on one big um, uh, trend data, uh, over the last few years, you can kind of look th um, through the grade levels there of three, four, five, six, um, as, you're, as you're going through there. Um, grade 10 was something we really looked at um, this year also because we did have a 5% uh, dip right there. Um, so we are um, looking into that and we're really looking at our um, what are they called, the evidence statements, where it really looks at what kind of questions, what are the components, what are the categories that we might have you know, slipped in a little bit or what, where our strengths and weaknesses are there so that we can increase that this year as well. Um, so in text, um, Queen Anne ranked sixth in the state, second on the shore um, overall down like just under 2% and then grade seven and eight is where we had the greatest, which was around five. So we're really looking into those um, evidence statements to see what really happened there. Um, the other thing that I really like to look at is this, and this is what I kind of got into last year was these cusps, uh, cusp, which is within the 10 points of proficiency. So we're talking about 750 score being proficient if we start looking at students that are within that 10 points, that 740 to 750 range, we're missing that by you know a single digit, um, just a few questions here and there. So overall, if we're looking at that, if we include CUSP within 10, we're looking at overall 674 kids, 674 students that were within that 10 points. If you include that across each one of those different sections, that's almost 20% looking through there. So you're looking at 76, almost 80% sometimes when we're looking at that of a proficiency level. Um, and we talked about last year also uh, when, when we did this about, um, you know, that 750 has kind of stayed still for a while um, as, as a scale score for proficiency while our tests have changed here and there. So kind of that moving target of, but that target is still still. Um, if you've, um, and when you listen to the news, read art articles and everything on MCAP that comes out, our state superintendent right now um, has made this a priority of hers um, to really look into this, has multiple teams that are looking into our, um, our testing. And so I'm really anxious to see like all the, all the work that they're gonna put in. Um, and you can see that I did that for each of the levels for elementary and middle school as well. Um, again, you can see just in grades three to five, you have 287 students, which pushes you up to almost 75% and almost 80% in middle school with 323 students that are just right off of there. So when our teachers are looking at that and you have those students that are just missing that, those are those students that we can actually, you know, really pay attention to, put those on our student learning objectives, really try to push them to that next level. But then the same thing of taking that um, that three to four range, if we're just missing it by a four, who are those students? And what can we do? And let's really look at theirs and how can we push that? So really being strategic between those lines um, is where we're really looking at. Before going on to math, any questions on English so far? I'm gonna is pause the, right there. The way the, they were doing the evaluation of the MCAP data, is it the same as they were doing last year or have they changed it again? Again, since last year. Same thing, it's still an adaptive test, so it's still, you know, if, if you get one wrong, it'll take you back a little bit. If you're getting it right, it'll, it'll boost you up. Um, so I know that's been a study going forward also into how, how effective that's been also, um, because if you end up taking that test and say you start off kind of rough and you get the first couple wrong, how far can I really get? Can I, because we can get up to an 850, but if you start missing questions, where does that ceiling go? 
So I know there's a study going on right now at MSDE, um, which I'm really looking forward to seeing on that also, because we are pretty new in year two of like the adaptive tests. Okay. And then how do they take into account for where you have the column in here where it says test counted, how do they take into account like the different counties and the amount of students within the district? Is there, do they use an average or do they, is there something else they use to? So for that count, I mean, that's the, the exact, exact that's how many number? completed okay. tests that they had for those students okay. um, for that test. Okay. All right, I have basically the same thing um, for math. So in math, um, Queen Anne is at 28.7% proficiency, which is eighth in the state, um, still second on the shore. Again, we have these same kind of charts right here. Again, I really want to look at um, in between um, in between the lines of really looking at the threes and fours and where we can move students. Again, that's also for grades three to five and six to eight. Um, one highlight that, that I was really happy to see was, because it's been a huge focus of ours, was algebra. Mm -hmm. So we did see a nice increase from 177 <laughs> to 24.5%. Um, in algebra, I know it doesn't sound like a lot when you're saying 24.7% as proficient. However, it was a nice boost um, from, from 17. I know um, across the state, it's been a huge, um, a huge focus, um, especially with our CCR measures really pushing on algebra um, to get them college and career ready. Um, so that's been um, a huge push for us as well. well that was nice I'm, to see. I'm looking on eight. I mean, that to me is a, is a, is a looks like a problem. Yeah, so eighth grade, if you go back over the years, it's always been kind of low, like that 13, 14, even 11. Yeah, but um, 18, 18, 19, you had 32. Right. So one thing that, that I need to look at also is when we go back and look at the numbers, you have to remember our eighth grade numbers takes out those students that are taking Algebra 1 also. So those, al those eighth graders that take Algebra 1, they're calculated into the Algebra 1 category, not the eighth grade which that does sort of bring it down, but as we increase the amount of students that we keep getting into Algebra 1 also, different, different kind of ways well. back and forth, and a completely different test. It's, it's, it's a different test between 18 and 19, and it is okay, because I mean, when I see a trend, oh, from when, 18, I, see, 19, when, when I see 32, yes, when I see 32 when 6, and I'm then sorry. I see 11, 4, I, I, you know, that's a big dip. If, but like you said, that's always bothered me. I think um, Ms. Cape said the same thing. Is it the same test? You know, when you yeah, start the changing 18, things, 19 and, ones are completely you're not mixing apples and, ap apples and oranges. Right, completely different. Okay. Um, so in text again, everything I just said, um, eighth in the state, second on the shore, um, increased just over um, a percent, but um, algebra took a nice increase. I did the same thing with math for the cusp um, with 10 uh, proficiency points just to just to see the same point. And again, we're around that 20% increase when, when, we, uh, when we include those students. So again, it's something that when I get on state calls um, with the rest of the LACs um, and um, accountability uh, people at the state really throw these numbers out and say, you know, and talk to the other counties as well, and they're seeing much of the same thing. So can we look at some of these cut scores? Because look what we're doing here. Our kids, you know, is it really that 750? Because within that range right there, those students are still doing very well. I mean, that's still a 725 to 750. Um, and when looking at those evidence statements, there's, there's a lot of things that, that, that we can do in other areas but they're still doing very well in, in certain areas. Um, so in our schools, I think we do a really good job of conferencing with our students one-on-one -on -one with our teachers. They do an amazing job with that, um, especially when they look at this, they look at iReady when they take those and they really converse with, with them and really celebrate even the, the, little, the little bit of, of growth that, that we can make. So not just saying like, oh, we're, you know, this, this is only our proficiency, no, really, really pushing on those celebrations of, of increase. So um, I'm curious to know if the, um, if they're looking at a correlation between the students who are within 10 points and GPAs, like, hmm. and, you know, how well are they doing in the class or, or how, right. what is their GPA? I know they're using GPA for other things, especially as it relates to dual enrollment. 
with much greater success than any of the entrance exams that we ever used before. Right, and they even they even put GPA into the CCR this year yeah, also. So, so. I'm, I'm curious how that would correlate. You know, of just that within 10 points, you know, how does that GPA correlate to that? And are those students having success at a 2.75 or 3.0? Um, you know, Definitely something which, which I can to do. Our standards would say they're being successful. Sure. Um, that, that's what I would, would wonder. Definitely something I can look into. GPA is a little bit higher stakes as well because the students feel the, the, the pressure of what GPA does to them where right. since this is not tied to a graduation requirement, they don't necessarily have the same motivation all the time. I mean, in my experience, you know, GPA has been the greatest predictor of a student's yes. success in school and after school. Yeah. Um, and should be used as such right. to make a good prediction of how they're demonstrating their knowledge, right? Sure. So um, I, I do think that the state superintendent um, is absolutely concerned about our assessments to whether they are um, aligned to our curriculum um, and whether they're actually accurately testing what students need to know. Um, because you know what, I, I always see this and I'm like, we, our kids are so awesome and amazing. And, you know, when you look at the senior classes at graduation and look how many are getting into these very prestigious schools and, you know, everything that they're doing, going into different professions and everything, I, I don't see the correlation to that success. Right, and our APs in increase this. each year. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah, the AP, I mean, you know, um, right. Ken Island High School just got an award today. They were just today. notified of a bronze award for their AP um, yeah, they look at the seniors and um, how many seniors are taking the AP exam and how many are, are passing it and, and going throughout those scales. And Ken Allen did a really, really nice job. Queen Anne I actually just missed just it, by, missed it. By, by a few. Yeah, Ken Allen um, just missed silver by just right. like one, I believe. Like one, but, one percent. I mean, so those yes. students are being so successful, you know, and then you look at this and you're like, that doesn't correlate. correlate. And it's Seems not just like the us, same questions the state. over and state, over as well. So. It seems like the same questions. Yeah. So well, we have high hopes that our new state superintendent um, will move to, you know, look at alignment and, 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 and such, adjust whatever needs to be adjusted. That's a great segue to the science one because that was a huge, there was a lot of time spent on this one um, because of the fifth grade science test. So when we looked at science uh, five and eight, uh, the fifth grade um, across the state all counties really dropped. We dropped 16% um, from a 44% down to a 28%. State 32 down to 24. Something happened yeah. there. Something I mean, happened there. You don't. That just doesn't different. happen just like that. Yeah. Right. So there is. I know they are looking into that. We have no answers on that yet. But that was very shocking when we saw that. Um, and then on the opposite side, the the eighth grade one had a had a nice increase. Um, the state actually dropped one, but we had a nice increase where we actually, um, with a little bit of digging that I did, they didn't have the same kind of slides for this one. Um, I believe that we were first in the state in eighth grade. Yes. Um, so we did very well in that, but in fifth grade, I have no idea. Um, Are they the same test that was given from the 2022? Or, or did they change the test at all? Same test. Same, same test. test. And we were teaching the same curriculum. Our teachers were teaching the same thing, so... So we're not really sure what happened there. One of the tests had, a, I don't remember, had a, a missing section this year. I forget which, which level it was, um, but they did change it a, a little bit. Like they pulled like one standard out, which just made the others disproportionately more important. So I, I can get more data on that. The, was it in, in the science? Mm -hmm. okay. It was in the science. I, I know, I'm sorry that I don't remember the actual. That's fine. I can talk to Mr. Page about that as well. Um, basically what I just said and and even even so even with that drop we're still f like four percent above the state in fifth grade and then 20 percent above the state in eighth grade um, so looking at the average that way I mean we can look at it that way but we always want to look how we did from year to year mm -hmm. same thing with the uh, high school um, if you remember the high school um, in biology this year uh, last year was the first year we put the 20 percent um, this counted as 20 percent of their grade as well, because um, we had the um, that language put in. 
they did very well. They had a 6% uh, increase um, in proficiency. Um, the state also went up also, but we went up six. And overall, I don't have the slide in there, um, but overall that counting as 20%, I know a lot of people were very nervous about that and how that would go. Our kids did very well on that. Um, we thought like, we were, you know, afraid that, you know, it would, it would drop or how it would affect their grades actually did very well with their grades and, and really helped them and did a really nice job. Um, so there it is again, um, a 6% six, uh, 6 increase there, 9% uh, higher than the state. And then the points actually went up also up to a 749, um, which is five points higher than the state as well. When, when you take state numbers, because we're a small school system, 7,000, but when you take Prince George's County and some other counties, are you going by number of students, maybe the average? That's that's across the entire state. But, that's that middle. But but are you taking are you taking a county average or do you, or do you is it consider how many pupils are in that too when they do it? Yeah, that's what I was getting at. Because if you have like seven thousand here and then you go somewhere else, that might have twenty thousand kids. Obviously, the average is going to be different there. Because I mean, if, you, if you're taking in, if you're taking in Arundel, and I just know population over five hundred thousand people. And we're right. only 50,000 in Queen Anne's County. That's, it's usually on the total amount of students across, across, because it's usually that large number that they put it's right there. It's, 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 it's the, the they total don't, they don't number. weigh it heavily because they've got more students. They just weigh it by county. No, it's right. the total, okay. yes. Good question. Uh, government comes up. That actually moves into this year. This year, government will start uh, counting as 20% of the grade as well. So we're hoping to see the uh, same increases there. We did have a nice increase from 47 to 52% uh, uh, this, this past year while the state stayed the same. Um, so we're hoping to see the same kind of results um, once that starts. Again, 5% up there, 10% um, higher, and then the score came up to a 745. Social Studies 8, um, we were dead the same, 44 and, or I'm sorry, 49 and 49. Um, so that's something um, that we want to look into as well, but just absolutely the same as, as last year. That also is 12% higher than the state as well. So it's a, it's a good score. We just want to, you know, keep pushing it up higher. That brings me to the end for any other questions. I had a question kind of back to what Dr. Salen said. Have we ever looked at... Um, she mentioned the GPAs. Have we ever looked at the grade point averages pre-COVID versus now to see like where we are? Is like is there that big of a difference, or are we? I have still not on? pulled that, but I can put that on. My, I can I can look into that. Um, I did want to add. I'll be coming back later, also um, because not tonight, um, <laughs> but um, uh, <laughs> all of this information is on MD report card right now on the MCAP tab but the entire site is not updated yet because the school survey and a lot of those other things have to be put in there, like when we get the stars for the schools, all that. Um, that won't be until usually December or January-ish. Um, so once all that happens, um, I can definitely come back with a lot of that other data as well and share. Thank you. you know, I, I'd love to listen to data and hear what's going on as long as it's apples and apples. <laughs> you know, the problem I always have a problem with is when Two years ago, they did something different, or they didn't do this, or didn't do that, or change. I mean, you know, it, it, I, I, I believe numbers that they're steady and they're mm -hmm. accurate. But when you, so many things can screw a number up by just using something different, and I, it just seems like in education, every two or three years, the wheel's not round. We're going to reinvent it. I try my best with what I have. I, oh, look, <laughs> look, I'm preach. I'm not talking to you. I know. I know. <laughs> it's just it's just frustrating when we sit up here as board members and hear this stuff, and you know we're we're trying to get this everybody to do it, but sometimes it's just not. You know, it's it, you're using something different. You, one day you have Even a Chevrolet, that, next day you have a race car. Constantly just give kudos to the schools and all yeah. the all the hard work I mean, they I, do. We with do a what great job. Have, you, know? you know, I do have a question with Worcester. I don't know how pushing. they keep doing a little better than us, but that's uh, you know they well, I, they have so much staffing. Do they? Oh yeah, every elementary school has three. It has a gen ed teacher, a special ed teacher, and assist. I mean, they have a lot. Well, I mean, of staff. I think I think that's something small, we need to go small, to when we talk classes. about budgeting. You know, because when we lose staff, 
that hurts us. I think one of our strengths are we have staff, and if we start losing staff, yeah. you know, where are we getting our best bang for our buck? I agree. You know, mm -hmm. it, it put in our people, but do we need 10, or would we be better off having 15? That, that concerns me sometimes when we make decisions. Absolutely. Well, luckily, we dodged that bullet this year. Well, have to, for right now. For right now. Yes. Um, I just have a question. I mean, because we do, and I, I feel like I'm um, being a downer here, but we have so, we're doing so amazing with, with in Maryland, above all the averages. But nationally, uh, Maryland is below the national averages in your fourth and eighth math, fourth and eighth um, science. So I know that we're doing better than the average in, in Maryland, but have we compared how Queen Anne's County is doing nationally? Just because we're below average. We're, I, I think when I looked it up, um, like fourth grade math in 2022, nationally it was 235, Maryland's 229. There's only seven states lower than us, although we're quite, you know, there's lots that are equal to us. Mm -hmm. Do we look at, I mean, we're doing great for Maryland, but should we be doing, looking to maybe do better than Maryland? I mean, I, I'm usually just focused on what we're doing within our okay. county and our state. Um, I can look nationally, but I know like that's what our state superintendent's really looking at too, just okay. to There's only one, one test that's national test and that's called right. NEAT. Okay. Um, and that's only done at fourth grade, like, I, I, I don't want to quote yes. myself, I don't want to get mm -hmm. myself in trouble and miss Is that where the national grades, that's, that, that's yes. Yes. the school So that's the from. only, that's mm -hmm. the only national data right. that, um, that we could access and, right. um, and yeah. look at. And I, I think mean, part of the issue with that is Maryland doesn't necessarily teach standards to that test mm -hmm. where some states well do, i was wondering about that when i looked at the, nation, the nation's report card and saw that i didn't know how they do the comparison they must have some kind of way it's, though if they're doing the naep yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, i mm -hmm. think you hit the nail on the head are you teaching to that test mm -hmm. or are we That's teaching right. to the maryland we're teaching quote, the maryland unquote, standards now, blue right. Right. you know what i mean yeah. so, yeah. so you know we're teaching to what we're not forced to do but mandated to do where you know, if you give me a test and, okay, I want to go to this, and all of a sudden we fall off Maryland, but we want to get it, make, make, come up in the thing. So, you know, like I said, it, 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 there's no 55-mile-an-hour road all the way. Right. And everybody right. changes the speed limit. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I think the current MCAP contract is only for another year or two. It's so just, it's up now. They're, is it this year or next? Yeah. yeah. So we could be in for another change. Out. I think it's going out for our <laughs> oh, wait. the testing. They're changing we have the one testing. Potentially. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what we're fighting. They're going to change it again. Yeah. It's definitely changing. Mm -hmm. So then once, and once you do that, then all your old uh, data. data so you can't really that. follow, you can't even like look longitudinally like right. students in our yeah. system to watch how they're doing because. It must be keeping somebody in a job. Yeah. Right. I mean, I, that's why I have so much faith in our iReady data, and I feel like that is so much more valuable for our staff to use to be able to not only identify where students have needs for areas of growth, but also to identify their strengths. Um, and, and I just think that that's like, it's real time. It, it, it gives them live data throughout the year, and, and, it's, and it's right there in their classrooms that they can share with their students. Yes. Yeah, so I have to say on graduation day when they're all standing up saying what they're going, where they're going, what they've achieved, it, it's, it is impressive. It's very it impressive. It is impressive. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Grove. Thank you. Thank you Mr. Grove. All right, Mr. Burklow, back up here. <laughs> we should put him back to back. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, we should have an 801. I, we didn't create the schedule, okay? We're going right. <laughs> to. All right. Good evening again. All right. All right. So uh, before I'm coming before you this evening uh, to provide an information update on FY25 capital projects. Uh, these are projects that um, the board approved last year through the uh, through various approvals, um, and I just wanted to provide an update on. The, the many different projects that we were able to complete and many others that are still in the pipeline. Um, first on the, uh, on the uh, list here is the Bayside Elementary School Security Vestibule. Um, this project uh, basically provided a, uh, a secure entrance where visitors, when they uh, buzz in at the exterior door, uh, they no longer have free access to the rest of the school. They have to uh, enter directly into an office area. You'll see the office area in the photograph on the on the lower right. 
or I'm sorry, lower left. And then on the upper right, you'll see the, uh, the new door that was cut into the vestibule. The doors that enter from the vestibule into the school, those are locked uh, during school hours. So, so nobody can enter into the school. And feel free to ask any questions during the presentation. So um, next is the uh, secure vestibule at uh, Kent Island High School. Uh, similar to Bayside, this is a uh, vestibule uh, opening that was created so an individual can now set out in the uh, vestibule area and be a direct one-on-one -on -one contact to any person buzzing in at the exterior and they are vetted a second time face-to-face -face, and then they can check in uh, and then be buzzed into the uh, into the school to either access the the main office or go to a volunteer space or wherever uh, wherever they may be going. Next up, we have the uh, vinyl floor tile replacement at Mattapique Elementary School. Uh, this project uh, was completed over uh, over the summertime and uh, basically took all of the uh, vinyl floor tile that was in many of the instructional areas and through the instructional corridors. The main corridor of the school is Terrazzo, so that was not replaced or touched. That's a, that's a product that um, stands the test of time and lasts for a lot longer than, than the vinyl uh, composition floor tile. Next, we have Mattapique Middle School interior painting. Uh, this project, um, the school probably looks the same as it did um, last year because we maintained a lot of the, the, the exact same color scheme throughout the school. Uh, the school wasn't dated at all, um, so we maintain the same color scheme. Uh, the only exception to colors uh, is, is what you see in the upper right there. That is the, uh, the service corridor that runs between the admin suite and the backside of the, cafeteria, uh, the uh, kitchen. And uh, what we did there was we painted a, a about a 48 inch wainscot in there with the darker um, tan color to help hide scuffs and, and just help preserve the, uh, the finishes there a little bit. Um, next, uh, this project is about 99% complete. This is the Queen Anne's County High School roof replacement. Project has been going very well. Um, one of the questions that, um, that, that we've gotten asked a few times um, is the um, the color of the wall panels for the uh, the uh, uh, auditorium area there? And as you can see on the auditorium, there are a uh, like a cream color, uh, and then that's offset with the uh, new green uh, coping that runs around the perimeter of the roof. So it's a very nice color combination. Complements the school colors as well. Those uh, wall panels will also go. Uh, on the uh, section of the wall that you see in the picture on the screen. Uh, it was approved last month at the last board meeting, the change order for the additional wall panels. They'll go on that section of brick that you see that's for the, uh, for the gymnasium space. Um, and this is a thermal image of the uh, roof while it was under construction. Um, we, we, uh, we now have a, a drone that we can fly to do um, thermal imaging, which will help us detect roof leaks and some of the things to help with maintenance as well as roof replacements in the future. I'm look, because I'm a little familiar with that school, that round thing, what, I, I don't, I, I can't figure out where, where I'm looking at it. Which one, what, what am I looking at? First walk in the door? The uh, lobby. The lobby. lobby. When you the first front? walk in? Mm -hmm. That's, that's mm -hmm. the section there that's, it, you see the white, um, look behind I'm going to try to, right oh yeah. no, I see that picture, next picture. Right. Yeah, the it's next the picture is, is the same, it, it's just a, a different angle and it's a, okay. and it's a little closer. Gotcha. Okay, awesome. moving on, um, Queen Anne's County High School, um, we did a stadium light replacement. Um, this was a very interesting project. Um, uh, it, it basically took the existing um, high pressure sodium lights that were there that take about 15 minutes to warm up and heat up. So if, if something happens during a game and the lights go out, we have to postpone the game until the lights can come up to full lighting. Uh, these lights were uh, replaced uh, utilizing um, uh, 
the existing, they're called standards, but the existing poles that were there, only one of the poles needed to be replaced. And the contractor performing the work out there, uh, they actually uh, came on site and they requested to, uh, to provide a drone that they were going to fly on their own because they wanted to use this as a marketing tool <laughs> for, for their uh, for their own uh, marketing. And so they, they actually provided us with a copy of the video. I'm hoping that it plays. Here we go. So is it going to play? Is it going to play? It is not going to play. I can help if you need it. I know where to get it. Yeah, it, it's going to be down here in the agenda. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it was a separate. You had a link to it. What that one goes up? Why isn't it coming up? Oh, you want me? Yeah, I do want you to help. <laughs> <laughs> you any kickbacks on their marketing? <laughs> <laughs> okay. It is amazing. Though. Same thing. Just on the agenda. Two it, windows. I'm not here. Yes. Mm -hmm got the display duplicated again because you opened your PowerPoint. If you close it, close it, come on. And then there's your agenda. Go down again. Yep, yeah, shouldn't it play from here? Uh, just do it here. <laughs> Sorry. Go to my boarded agenda. Yep. And here. then when you click here and then your link, I got you. There we go. There we go. Oh. Sorry. Yeah. That's all right. That's why you do construct. Operator area. <laughs> Operator area. There we go. <laughs> you don't need the music. Yeah, we do. Oh, we like oh, it. Yeah, yeah, we okay, do. Okay, we do. Good gracious. Just turn it down a little bit. Let's see if I can get back to where I was now. Yeah, I heard there was quite quite some comments um, at the football game the other that's night. Oh, really? Yeah, because it really does. Like they have, huh, they can cool. make it flash lights. like that. They, yeah, Welcome. with music, it will go to the beat of the music. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so. The previous lights were thirty foot candles, and now there's forty foot candles out there. And the other area that we really improved upon was you would get the students and gathering around the um, concession stand and kind of the field house wasn't very well lit and now it's light up. Yeah, we do have, we, we did provide decent foot candles out at those outside public areas. Some of the other nice things about uh, gameplay um, is, is that the lights feature something called ball tracking and I, it, it never even dawned on me, but apparently um, when a kick or a punt is done uh, in, in, during a, a, a night game, if that ball goes above the lights of the stadium, it's in pitch dark sky. So the person on the other end trying to receive the ball loses that visual contact with the ball until it drops back down below the, the light standards and then gets picked up in the light again. So then, then they're tracking it. So one of the things that the new lights has, they have something called ball tracking, and they're basically two lights on each light standard that shine upward that allow that ball to be tracked when it's up above the um, the, the, the other lights that shine down on the field. And cool. I've already received the question, well, Queen Anne's County High School got this. When are we doing it for Ken Island? Ken Island is on the agenda for <laughs> FY26. So, I just wanted to so, get that out there. So Thank you very much. They're on the when, uh, when we come before you for the locally funded projects, Ken Island High School will be on that for uh, for stadium light replacements. And the and the plan is to provide them with the exact same system. So there is <laughs> so there is no uh, so there's no difference between the schools. Very good. Thank you. Sure.
Um, moving on, um, I think it was mentioned earlier in the board meeting, the, uh, the sidewalk that leads from Centerville Middle School to Queen Anne's County High School um, to help uh, get our students over to the YMCA. Um, the concrete work is done. The um, uh, ADA truncated domes are, are installed. We do have some signage yet that we need to install to identify the crosswalks as well as some uh, crosswalk striping uh, that's going to be done. Uh, we, we've already let the um, uh, contract for that uh, installation to occur and we're just waiting on the weather to, to cooperate a little bit better to get some of those materials down on the asphalt. You know it's already been used though, right? Um, mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I've seen when, students when it, on it several times. When they cross from the high school to the Y, I know it's a state road. 304. Mm -mm. Not, oh, yeah, 304, 304 state. Uh, have we made sure we had a proper sign? I mean, you know, just lights are flat. You know, I know at Washington College have a light to go across at a certain place, but I know we probably never get a light, but do we have something there to. Our, our recommendation to the school is to go up to the next crosswalk so it's not as wide for the, the middle school students so go up to basically to right where the uh, acme entrance is so it's a more narrow crosswalk and we have contacted the state about putting in um lights there but you know how that process works i just know some student from central middle school once you get to the high school we're going to go across rather than uh, it just we should leave, we've contacted the state anyway yes it looks good. I think I think it's it really a great does. project. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, you it know, very I mean, it really nice. puts it together. Very, nice. very well thought out too. With yes. how many cars are that are parked there? Well, like and, baseball and, and it's, it's baseball. up against the fence yeah. at, the, at the ball game, and yeah. you know, I mean, it, yeah. it's a. It amazed me. How, I mean, I guess it's not hard to put a sidewalk in, but they did it pretty quickly. Uh, About a week. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they move very quickly. Okay, next project is the uh, surveillance camera conversion. Um, uh, as we presented um, earlier this uh, past year, um, we awarded a contract to convert from our old camera system that was uh, has that had reached its end of life to a new surveillance camera system. That system is 100% operational, and uh, we've been uh, in the process of bringing uh, school administrators up on training for utilizing the new system. Um, additional projects, uh, capital projects that we've completed. Um, Centerville Elementary School, we've installed shades. Centerville Elementary, we've also in, uh, pro uh, completed the cell phone booster project. Church Hill, install the whiteboards, install shades, install clear touch, and install cell phone boosters. Um, Kennard, we've completed the installation of whiteboards. Ken Island High School, phase two underground stormwater repairs. Uh, also installed whiteboards. Uh, 10 classrooms have been painted. Uh, Mattapeak Elementary School, we've installed window shades. Middle School has received a new uh, telephone system that was uh, completed through uh, the aging school projects through the state with state funding. Uh, Mattapeak Middle, uh, Epson Bright Link projectors. And then Sudlersville um, Elementary is the uh, last cell phone booster project that was completed. We do have two more that will be on the next slide as pending. They'll, they'll be starting them later this month. When we do a cell phone booster, that's for all. I mean, is there like different ones like AT&T and Verizon or is it just all one booster? It is the three providers. So okay. what they do is, is they come into the school um, they they install electronics within the school, and then there are antennas uh, that are connected via uh, a large coaxial cable, and they connect all of the antennas throughout the interior of the school through uh, through the uh, corridors, and then they take the electronics and extend it up onto the roof, and then there's three separate antennas that are aimed to help uh, with the three separate carriers, and it's Verizon, AT and T, and Sprint. And they can pick up a tower. There's some tower close enough to look at. They, they, what they do is, is they try to amplify the existing uh -huh. signal that's in the area. Um, the, the issues are going to be um, if the if the signal is weak in that area, it's not going to boost the signal beyond what 
you have out, outdoors. Um, the other the other things are uh, inherent with with any uh, electronics. So if you're um, in an area and and sunspots are exp uh, uh, giving you problems with reception and that sort of thing, those same problems are going to exist with with these types of systems. It's 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 not a workaround for those kind of, of issues. The other thing is is that. Um, if anybody's familiar with um, utilizing Wi-Fi versus using your cellular data for calling, some people uh, enable Wi-Fi calling, and what they do is they pretty much piggyback on the Wi-Fi system to make calls. Um, that will help save minutes and those sorts of things, but that um, will also not see any benefit from the, the cell phone boost because again you're not using the cellular signal you're you're going on to a completely different network but like our staff or, and security people who have two we got the cell plus we got the wi-fi that they can hook up either way correct and 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 i have instructed um the schools that were done last year the the the, the five schools that were done last year we did have a little bit of of um of an instructional um period where I had to go over some of those things where, where folks just weren't really aware of, you know, what, well, you know, you've got to turn Wi-Fi calling off to see the benefits of this. So. Is um, Talkie and Chop Tank, since they're running cable out there, have they come up past the school yet? I'm sorry, sir. For Chop Tank, um, for the Wi-Fi, when you're talking about the Wi-Fi and then Talkie, since they got all the grants out there, because I know they've run, I live out that way, and one side of the road is Chop Tank and the other one is Talkie, and I know they're headed out that way. Would that, if they did come by, would that be something the school could utilize to get better well, internet? It, it would, get, and that would be totally different from cell phone boosters. We're talking about fiber, um, but to, 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 um, we have to, to fiber. We have fiber already to Southern School. Who do you guys? Middle think? School, it's through the state. Through the state out there, okay. And, and kind of piggybacking on that, we've already been in communication with Talkie for fiber for the new central office uh, because right now they are out at, oh my gosh, I'm gonna, they're out at 50 right now and they're looking to extend it in towards the high school and they're looking at having that done and to the edge of, the, edge of our site and ready for us for, to, for us to hook up for any of the paid um, internet that we would need to provide for, for the central office. And that's a state fiber optic. That's the Talkies fiber. Oh, talk, yeah, talk, talk, Talkies. Because the state fiber. comes up through Centerville state. through Chestertown. Correct. Correct. But Talkies is, is coming up there as well to give us redundancy in fiber for the, for the central office. So uh, capital projects that are, are in progress um, we have Bayside and Graysonville. We have school-based health centers that are in design, um, that, that's in the very infant stages of design. Um, Canard, we have the contract award of the fire alarm replacement that just received state approval. Also uh, uh, down a couple below that, um, we have, um, is it up there? Um, well, we also had, um, the Queen Anne's County, oh, there it is, Queen Anne's County Fire Alarm. That project also uh, went in parallel with the uh, Canard Fire Alarm project. So both of those projects did receive uh, state approval. So we have awarded the contracts to those, to those vendors. Uh, moving on, Kent Island High School, we have the uh, contract awarded for the makeup air, makeup air unit replacements. We have scoreboard replacements at Kent Island High School Gym and Queen Anne's County High School gym, as well as the stadium at Queen Anne's County High School. We have the contract award for additional security cameras at Mattapique Elementary School. Um, Mattapique, um, I have a typo there, it should be middle school. Cell phone booster install, that project will be starting uh, in October later this month. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Um, we. Uh, as presented tonight, we have the award of the two to five year old uh, playground replacement at uh, Sudlersville Elementary School. Um, and then at Stevensville Middle School, we have the contract award for the heat pump replacement, as well as the uh, additional security cameras. And then 
rounding things up, we have Sutlersville Middle School with the last install for cell phone boosters for this year. And last but not least, the new central office building. Um, that project is coming along nicely if anybody's driven by. Um, the, pro uh, the, the picture that's in the photograph there is uh, about a week or two old. Um, they've uh, been continually uh, working on bringing the uh, light gauge metal framing around the perimeter of the building. So they'll, they'll be um, bringing roof materials on site. Uh, uh, they, they arrived this week. So we should start seeing some roof activities, get the building dried in, and hopefully see some interior activity very, very soon. How's the work going without the architect on hand? I know that that was. For the, for the last four months, that is the present, that is the present plan. Well, he's on hand. He's on hand now. Mm -hmm. He's just won't be on hand for the last. Mm -hmm. When are we months. anticipating the finish? Uh, it would be June. next summer. Okay. Summer of 2025. Any questions or comments? I, I, I think we do a good job with our maintenance. I mean, I think we keep our buildings up. It's something a lot of people don't see and notice when we go through these budgets for operating. But, I mean, our capital, we stay up on. And, uh, you know, I think our schools, when you go to look at other schools, I think ours are second to none. I mean, we keep them up. Thank you, Mr. Berkman. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. All right. Last but certainly not least, talking about next year, having a discussion about the budget. Starting early. Yeah. Oh. Um, so I, I wanted to let the board know that this will be a standing budget item, I mean a standing agenda item for the board to talk about that, of course. Um, as you know, we'll be starting our budget process in November. So I kind of wanted to get the placeholder in there and then to give you an update on the performance audit, actually. So as you know, our commissioners have um, hired a firm to be able to perform a performance audit for us. Um, we actually um, were notified on Sunday morning that we would be kicking that off on October 1st. So the county actually met with the new firm on October 1st and we have an engagement meeting with them um, this Friday. So our team will be meeting with their team as well as with the company to um, talk about um, the audit and what we, you know, what's the timeline, what we need to provide for them. We do have, I have forwarded to the board the engagement letter so you can see the scope of work. Um, and so uh, our CFO and, and the staff in the area of finance um, will um, provide all and any information that's requested. Um, some of that may come as it relates to transportation was in there, as you well know. There was some information as it relates to um, our benefits package and things that we offer for our employees. Um, so Dr. Noel and Mr. Pinder will be participating. And of course, our assistant superintendent will be there along the way. So we will keep you posted on that. Um, I didn't know if anybody had any questions. But that I don't, but what I would like to see, a lot of stuff we know about next year's budget today. We know we're four days in the hole with furlough days. Correct. We know what our contract commitment is for next year. Correct. We will know in October the 15th roughly what the anticipated retirement of the people that want to stay whole for this year. Um, we understand, you know, fuel and electricity, we can put in something that's a reasonable thing. It could change. But, but I'd really like to start seeing November and December, you know, get some numbers together and they can change. I know they will. And, you know, but we just need to start really seeing what we have because it, to me, it's not rocket science and we just know what we're going to have to do. And it's no use to sit there and think this is going to happen or that's going to happen. I think we need to look at some hard numbers as early as we can, put dates on them mm -hmm. and they can adjust. But some of the stuff I think should be pretty close to what we're going to need. Yeah. And we do you know? know, I mean, at this point we're past the September 30th count. So uh, while we don't have it finalized, mm -hmm. we know that we're basically flat right well, now. If we're flat, then we're so, not going to look at maintenance so we, effort. We, we need to look at that. Um, we did do a projection out um, with an increase on all of our cost of doing business. Mm -hmm. um, we knew, obviously, like you said, contractually, what our responsibility is there for um, salary enhancements. We also included 7.5% increase on insurance, which is what the county was projecting as well. Um, so we do have those numbers um, now. We'll see. We did that like this summer, so we'll see how that compares as we start to get some real numbers. In uh, place. But if we have, if we have um, seven and a half in there, 
and it ends up and and if it's exactly a million right. dollars or a million two and it goes up a little bit or down that that can be adjusted but we also want to i mean some you know we have dual I mean, dual enrollment we've seen that go up right. drastically which is state national board thing, certification national board huge. certification so you know if we have 30 people in the pipeline and it's going to cost us ten thousand dollars a person and we know that's another three hundred thousand dollar price tag. If right. we have dual enrollment and we have, you know, two hundred thousand, and we've already spent two fifty this year, mm -hmm. we need, you know, it, you know, we need to at least have earmark it, and then we make decisions. Yes. Because personally, I think it's not a good idea to get. I mean, I know you have some nutrition, but it's not good. Get a, yeah. a mass exit of people is not going to help us. And we were notified last week through ESMEC Trust that our energies through electric are going up significantly. Um, so, Mr. About Pinder. 20, 21, 22 percent. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's because, in, of course, supply is almost as much as electricity anymore. But I know mine was nine cents, and now it's up to 12 an hour. So that's for they residential. Gave us, they gave mm -hmm. us the three year projection, right. um, which is the same each. Well, about yes. the same each year so yes for it'll be about 21 percent next year and the following year it'll be about 21 22 percent on top of that so i mean that's another thing that we I mean because you know it, it, it's whatever you do is good but you know we go all these green schools and all this that ain't covering anything right. you know what i mean it's just putting your finger in the dike and more water's coming over the top right and, and I, the additional um pre-k classrooms mm -hmm. that we put in this year mm -hmm. um to make sure that everybody was full day those teachers come onto our roster next year they're paid for state funding this year as mm -hmm. they as we expand pre-k and, and, and if we know um, all that that can be done on a sheet and the ia and that can be done by you know november yeah. december before we go to on holidays and then get in the budget season in january at least we know where we are mm -hmm. and because it's so screwed up the way we do things not us but the right. way the so state the has state things set so up that we you know we have mm -hmm. contracts we negotiate this we do that we don't know what our funding is Correct. there's more mandates there's this and that and then all of a sudden june everybody gets mad at everybody which i don't blame everybody to be mad because you know we we need to make things work but you know some of this stuff's being thrown on us that okay here's coming you know and then we have to make some hard decisions right well as i said we we predicted out um uh, an overall ask of 7.5 percent so as we gather additional data pieces as we're moving through mm -hmm. um, but you say 7.5 percent what i want to see is 7.5 million, million. million sorry, what i what i want to see million. yeah million and, and is that is yeah. that a real figure with all this other stuff we got with right. the enrollment and this well, that's what state. i mean that was our that's where we're starting so are, are we just under or just over you know because i don't we're not going to be and that's adding the four furlough sure. days in yes okay Yes. And then, and then we know if we, if we need yes. seven point five million, then and the state's going to give us eight hundred thousand. Right, right. That's exactly. That we know the county is going to be up two hundred thousand yeah, to, to one school. To one school. Yeah. Exactly. That's your because exactly. because you know the county doesn't strike their our budget or their budget to us until June. June. Well, there's decisions we got to make before then. Yes. And we'll be making decisions early spring. And we might have option A, B, and C. Correct. You know, yeah. but at least know about them and. You know, we all got to get this out this together. I mean, we're, we're all in here for the students, but, you know, everybody's got their own little wish list, too. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a bunch of, yeah, challenging times for sure. Yeah, it's going to be. It's always has been. I mean, it's getting worse, but it's never going to be. There's, there's never going to be enough money. Everybody's going to want something. All right. Anything else about budget? Okay. <laughs> it is public comment. Do we have anyone signed up? Nope. There wasn't anyone anybody out there. Ask anybody okay. you want to? Did anyone want to speak? Okay. Future meetings. Our next regular meeting will be the 6th of November. Can I get a meeting to adjourn? So moved. All those in favor? Aye. All right. Thank you very much.